Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Patakati Paiho Payayo Viro Vidya Veda Namo Patahi Om Jagama Deva Vinasya Deshatya Karanati Kami. <clears throat> Thereafter, within a very few days, by the influence of the mantra that Chichu Kacha had practiced, his mind became increasingly enlightened in spiritual progress and he attained shelter at the lotus feet of the Purport, a devotee's ultimate achievement is to take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord in any one of the planets in the spiritual sky. As a result of rigid execution of devotional service, the devotee receives all material opulence if these are required. Otherwise, the devotee is not interested in material opulence, nor does the Supreme Lord award them. When the devotee is actually engaged in devotional service of the Lord, his apparently material opulences are not material, they are all spiritual. For example, if a devotee spends money to construct a beautiful and costly temple, the construction is not material but spiritual. Your Bande Krishna Sambande, Yukta Vairagya Uchta The Devotee's mind is never diverted to the material side of the temple. The brick, stone, and wood used in the construction of the temple are spiritual. Just as the deity, although made of stone, is not stone, but the supreme personality of God himself. The more one advances in spiritual consciousness, the more he can understand the elements of devotional service. Nothing in devotional service is material, everything is spiritual. Consequently, a devotee is awarded so-called material opulence for spiritual advancement. This opulence is an aid to help the devotee advance towards the spiritual kingdom. Thus, Maharaj Chitraketu remained in material opulence as a Vidya Dara Pati, master of the Vidya Dharas. By executing devotional service, he became perfect within a few days and returned home back to Dhatu, taking shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord Shesha Ananta. The karmi's material opulence and the devotee's material opulence are not on the same level. Srila Bhagavacharya comments in this way, Ayantayaminam Vishnum Upasyasya Sami Padaha Vavedyo Gyatayatasya Padam Vapanyam Malaha by worshipping Lord Vishnu, one can get whatever he desires, but a pure devotee never asks Lord Vishnu for anything material profit. Instead, he serves Lord Vishnu without material desires, and therefore ultimately transferred to the spiritual kingdom. In this regard, Srila Vira Raghava Acharya comments, Yatesta Gatir Ityartha. By worshipping Vishnu, a devotee can get whatever he likes, Maharaj Chitraketu wanted only to return home back to Godhead, Godhead, and therefore he achieved success in that way. Namaste, Saraswati Deva, Gauravani, Pacharine, Nirvi, Sarasana, Sunya, Vanadi, Pasyatya, Deva, Sitarine, Panchakalpa, Duru, Vishyaki, Pasindu, Veda, Chakapita, Ram, Bhavani, Vyo, Vaishnava, Vyo, Namaho, Namaha, Jai, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, 
Sri Advaita Gadakar Sivasavi Gaur Bhakavimu Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Hare Hare So sometimes people misunderstand and imagine that material means what you can see and touch and perceive. Spiritual means what you can't see, what you can't touch, something that is invisible. But this view in particular explanation uh, describes that well sorry the first. Ultimately, when you go back to the essence of all activities, you find that the basic principle is the, the source is Krishna. And Krishna creates the material world through his agency. And his agencies take the, the ingredients, the basic ingredients, and formulate the different forms in this material world such as the bodies of the 8,400,000 living entities. And they're simply made out of these eight elements, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhumir Apanyalo Bhai, Kamara Bhude Vacha, Ahankar Iti Ame, Pinakakriti Astiga, Earth, Water, Fire, Air, Ether, Mind, Intelligence, and False Ego, Make up my separated material energy. So, what Krishna is explaining ultimately is that whatever is created by him is spiritual. Krishna can't create anything material because material has to be understood in relationship to spiritual, because spiritual is the source of all existence. And Krishna is pure spirit. And therefore, whatever he creates is also spiritual. And then that same spiritual energy, when it's used in different ways, it takes on certain characteristics. Therefore, when the elements, the basic elements, earth, water, fire, or ether, formulate the different bodies, that is material. Or when those bodies or any item made out of these eight elements are connected to the source again, they regain their spiritual essence. In other words, they're spiritual. As here Prabhupada said, the bricks, the stones, the stone of wood used in the construction are spiritual. Just like the deity is made out of wood, sometimes stone, metal. But then the deity can't be material because the deity is Krishna. So they say, well, it's actually the outside is material, the inside is Krishna. But that is a wrong understanding because the essence of all existence is spiritual. What material is, material means cut off. That's a simple definition of material. When you take something and you cut it off from its source, and it, it takes on a different uh, definition and quality. Similarly, just like if you take a hand, when it becomes part of the body, it's very useful. But then if you cut that hand off, it's no longer connected to the body and it has no use at all. And therefore, it is just, yeah, it's useless. And for in the same way that when we cut ourselves off from Krishna or anything, that is created by the Lord through his various energies, Parashi Shafi Vudhaya Suyate, Prabhavika Gyanam Palakri Hacha, can only be spiritual because the source is also spiritual. We have examples that great souls, their bodies, sometimes at the time of death, does not deteriorate. You can go and you can actually see it in the uh, Sri Sampradaya. If you go to you know, Rangi Kshetra, and you can see it covered with resin is the actual body of Ramanujacharya. 
the body would not deteriorate and is simply preserved with resin. And in the same way, we have examples in the Christian tradition, St. Teresa of Avila, her body lasted 400 years after she parted. Unfortunately, people started to cut up the body and take parts for their own little worship. <laughs> but the body never deteriorated. So when something is just like if you take iron and you put it into a fire, you leave it in the fire, after some time it becomes like fire. And then if you touch it anyway, it loses its metallic characteristic and takes on the principle of fire, it burns. So in the same way, anything used in the service of the Lord becomes spiritual, including our consciousness. Now our consciousness by nature is spiritual. Yeah, because consciousness cannot be material, but it's covered by the material energy, and therefore it appears to be material. But when that consciousness again is engaged in the service of the Lord, it cuts through the coverings and again it retains its natural spiritual essence. So in that way, nothing uh, and nothing used in the service of the Lord or connected with the Lord can be spirit material. It can always be made in the spiritual essence. Although it may look material, it may often may handle it and feel material still. But spiritual simply means connected with the source. Material means disconnected. And that is the, the correct understanding. It was like Prabhupada was discussing with one uh, uh, who was a devotee. And he became a friend of Srila Prabhupada. His name was Dr. Patel, who uh, joined Srila Prabhupada's morning walks in Bombay in 1973, and then mostly in 74. He would come every day practically. And then he would, many times, he would argue with Prabhupada on philosophical points. He had some knowledge and some understanding. And Prabhupada was saying that the spiritual master's body is spiritual. And Dr. Patel was saying, well, yeah, but not like Krishna. And Prabhupada said, no, spiritual means spiritual. So then the argument went on, and finally Prabhupada used that example. If you take an iron rod and you place it in the fire, leave it there for some time. So the understanding of spiritual, it means fully engaged in the service of the all-spiritual, pure personality of God. Then it takes on the spiritual qualities also. And it will act also in a spiritual way. So depending on how, how much that body and mind and consciousness is absorbed in the same way. So if we engage in devotional service, we transcend the material energy and come to the spiritual platform. And then although we are in the material world, we are not touched by the material world as long as we stay engaged in devotional service. As soon as we deviate from devotional service, we again re-enter into the material energy again. But as long as anything is engaged in the service of the Lord, it is spiritual. And so therefore Prabhupada wants to make the point that the devotee is not interested in anything in this world, but because they have some services, they use whatever they have, their money, their time, their energy, their personal properties, they use it in the service of the Lord. And then that becomes spiritual. So spiritual means elevating and material means degrading. So everything is more like a double-edged sword, just like you can use the example of a knife. A knife can become very useful in cutting your food like that 
or carving a uh, you know a figure but the same knife can be used to kill so in the same way everything material can be used in the service of the lord or in the service of one's own mind and senses and that's the difference between material and spiritual And so Prabhupada said, a devotee may have material opulences, but they are not concerned about enjoying any material opulences, nor about accumulating more material opulences. If Krishna wants to give them something material, they accept it. But their main concern is to please Krishna and engage in devotional service. And the Prabhupada makes this point over and over because people still they don't get it that spiritual means engaged in devotional service and material means be engaged in other activities that are contrary to devotional service or parallel, you might even say. So a devotee is not interested in anything material, but sometimes you see devotees are very well to do. They have a good material arrangement and others have very little. But either one doesn't make them either bene benefit more advanced than the other. It's not that if you have more, you're more advanced uh, spiritual, or if you have less, you're more advanced spiritual. No, it's your consciousness and how you use whatever Krishna gives you. Sometimes a devotee sometimes sees that his, their material life is simply a burden and they want to reduce their uh, attachment to material life by becoming more and more free from the encumbrances of material things and material activities. Pitra Ketu here, he was a great king. I mean, he was a powerful king. Uh, he had he describes in the earlier parts of the uh, Bhagavatam in this same canto. You know, he had ministers, he had cabinet members, he had a treasury, he had military, and he also had 10 million wives. So many things. Now he has nothing of that thing, but now he's happy. And all he wants to do is go back home, back to Godhead, taking shelter of Lord Ananta. They see the devotee of Ananta Dev. A devotee can be, a devotee is satisfied in devotional service. And if they get something material, they can use it. And if they don't get it, they don't lament. Because the characteristic of the different levels of existence are that the demigods, those in the higher planets, they always rejoice. They're happy. Those on the on this level, the human beings, we're always lamenting. We don't we want something, we don't get it, we're not happy. We get something uh, that we want and it doesn't make us happy. But we get something we want, makes us happy for a little a long while, then we lose it. Always lamenting. This is the nature of the material, of the conditioned souls. Lamenting over this, lamenting over that. I wish I had this. I wish I didn't go here. I, it's always lamentation. And for the animals, fear. Fear is their characteristic. So we don't, the Bodhi doesn't have to lament because whatever Krishna arranges by one's Natural devotional service, a devotee is happy. Doesn't have to make big arrangements to have so many things. Just simply, and Krishna gives, and Krishna takes away. The devotee doesn't worry. Oh, I have so much, and now I don't have as much as before. They understand that all of these things are simply Krishna's energy. And we don't own anything. Whatever we have, you know, it comes by way of our uh, needs in this material world and some endeavor to accumulate these things, but they are not ours. We can, the old saying, we come into the world 
with nothing and we leave in the same way. There's actually these, uh, there's one particular country, culture, I think it's the Egyptian culture, that when these great kings and Pharisees and uh, great personalities, they would die, they would bury their treasures with them. And then when they, when they come up in their next life, they can have all of the stuff they had in the previous life, which is ridiculous. Anyway. There was one story where one cartoonist, everybody knows him, Walt Disney, famous for Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. And the, the false form of Radha Krishna and cartoon uh, <laughs> play. So he, he became famous for, for these cartoons. And he became quite wealthy. I remember when I was growing up in the kid, as kids, you go to a movie and you go and sit in the movie for a particular movie, but they'd always show a cartoon in the very beginning of the movie. You know, it would be one of these Walt Disney cartoons, Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse, or like that. So he was very popular and he also became very wealthy. So at one point, he was getting old. So he was thinking, I want to you know, live longer. So, uh, but mm, then he heard about this thing called chirogenics. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Is that uh, they, you can go and they freeze your body after you die, keep it in a state where it doesn't deteriorate, some, some really ice cold refrigerators. And you pay them a large amount of money before you die. And then when they learn the secret of life, they bring it back, inject it into your body. And then voila, there you go. You're dancing again. So they have this program to cheat people. Of course, nobody can do that. Once the soul leaves the body, it doesn't return to that body. It goes somewhere else according to the karma dynamic trainer. So Walt Disney, he paid you know, large amounts of money to have his body frozen. And, but then after he died, the relatives were uh, saying, well, what about, you know, what about the, uh, what do they call it? The dowry or the heritage or the, you know, all of his possessions, where his relatives were entitled to that. But other people, but there was a, a big court case. Some were saying, well, he's going to come back and get all this stuff again. And others were saying, no, no, he's dead. So they had a big fight <laughs> and it went to court. And then at one time, somebody from the side of the relatives snuck into the area where his body was being freezed. And they pulled out the plug of the refrigerator. <laughs> so this is the activities of the foolish materialists. They think they can come back and again enjoy in this material body. But they're not enjoying it in the first place. And now they come back to just to, to increase their, their idea that, that they think they can enjoy again. So this is just an example of how foolishness it is to chase after material things. Therefore, a devotee doesn't waste time trying to work so hard in order to get material things. Whatever Krishna provides. And Krishna will provide if we make a, a little honest endeavor to maintain ourselves nicely, living gorgeously, or living simply is not the goal of life. The goal of life is Premukumarta Mahan to develop our love for Krishna, which brings the ultimate principle of happiness and satisfaction, fulfills all, all desires, and ultimately allows one to leave this material world and return to our home in the spiritual world. But people think, oh, I have to be rich, I have to have this. 
I have to have so many nice things in my life. And, you know, I have to work so hard. I remember we, we, there was one uh, man, one of my disciples, her and her husband used to work for this person. He had a big, big estate, large amount of area. And he would keep animals and horses on it. So they were they were living on the estate in the house that was living that was there on the estate, and taking care of the grounds, doing the agriculture and taking care of the uh, animals like that. And they were living free. That was their payment for taking care. They didn't have to pay anything for the for their living expenses, nor did they have to. They also got some salary. The man who had this wealth, he was living in the city in his office. He was every day working hard. And he would come out once or twice a year just to see what was going on in his land. And then he would leave and come back again after some time. But he never used the land. <laughs> Ultimately, he, would, he had it, but he never used it. This is a foolish materialist. They just like they say sometimes a person will accumulate so much money and they'll just put it in the bank and then the bank numbers go up and up and up. And every once in a while, they go look at the bank book and see, oh, how much money they have. They feel good that it's increasing like that. And then when they die, somebody else gets it. And it <laughs> well, this is material life. You can't keep anything in this material world and use whatever you need by the grace of Krishna. And Krishna will always take care of his devotees. He says that. Don't be up at the Jamahina with Bhakti Pramanshi. He provides for his devotees. He acts like he provides for all living entities. He takes care of his devotees. But many times we think we have to take care in such a way that we have to have more and more and more, and that will give us the satisfaction of life. But we just waste time, and therefore, therefore, it's simple living, high thinking is the basic principle of the execution of successful devotional service, because devotional service requires time. <laughs> How much time are we giving to Krishna? How much time are we giving to maintaining the body and the extensions of the body, family members, friends, and social, political, and economic obligations? So we have to see, because life is short, and uh, we, life is very short in Kali Yuga. People would live in other ages, they would live up to 10,000 years. Of course, in the Satya Yuga, they would even live longer. But in Trakti Yuga, 10,000 years. You read about people in the Bible, they were living 600, 800 years. Noah lived about 700 years. Now we don't know if, we, if anybody gets to 100 years old, they're considered to be a grand old man. It's a great achievement. But 100 years is like, Flash, nothing. But life is very short. Therefore, what is actually precious is not material things, but time. Time is the actual preciousness. So whatever time Krishna has given us in this world, if we use it to become Krishna conscious, then that time will take us Ultimately, to the area where there is no time, that is the spiritual world. Otherwise, we have to come back life after life and play the same game again. You know, working hard, getting money, having families, dying, and then doing the whole thing all over again. So, Chuchukitu, he went through it all. He had so much. <laughs> and then, at one point, because he... Because he wanted a son, and he got a son, and the son was taken away by providence. He wasn't meant to have a son, but because he wanted it, uh, Manarda Muni and Parvat Muni, they gave it to him in order to teach him 
that actually this is not your destiny. So we don't know. We just leave it up to Krishna. And therefore, that verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam explains uh, that one who is actually intelligent and philosophically inclined does not endeavor to find some permanent situation anywhere in this material world all the way up to the higher planets, because everything in this world is Dukkala Yama Sasra. It's temporary and it's full of misery. And the last part of the verse is, hey, whatever happiness you're destined to get, you'll get it. Whatever misery you're destined to get, you'll get it. Don't worry about the misery. Prabhupada was talking about this yesterday, a very extensive thing is that Nobody tries for misery, but it comes. Your happiness will come in the same way. Material happiness and material suffering are there within the karmic collection of the living entity due to their past and present activities. I don't, don't have to worry about you know, material things to try to improve our happiness. You can try to do that. You may also gain something by your endeavor. But you can increase your happiness. That's the point. The happiness and distress is allotted according to, you know, material energy. But when one takes the devotional service and engages in devotional service, they transcend all material happiness and distress, and they come to what is called the uh, Sutta Sattva platform, the pure platform, at least to the mode of goodness. When, they get, when we get to the mode of goodness, then that's a stepping stone ultimately to the platform of transcendence. So one should aspire to work in such a way that one uses their time and energy for uh, taking care of the most important thing of life, a relationship with Krishna. And, uh, and don't worry about material things. They'll come and they'll go. <laughs> It's like we had the example of Kolavetsu Sridhar. He had nothing. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would come to him every day. And Kolavetsu Sridhar was a banana salesman. He sold banana cups, banana plates, banana leaves. And he would make a little, few pies here and there, and then he would use some of it for himself and give the rest of it to worship Mother Ganga. And at one point, Lord Chaitanya revealed himself as the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the house of, uh, of uh, Srivas Thakur. That's a very famous pastime when the Lord acted in his role as the Supreme Lord. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was always in the Chana avatar, hidden avatar. He would not like to present himself as who he actually was but he wanted to present himself as a devotee of Krishna. And he very carefully did that. But this particular pastime, he revealed himself. And the devotees were so happy and they were worshiping him. At one point, Lord Chaitanya asked the devotees, go find Sridhar. Sridhar came, and when he saw that same person who was coming to buy his um, banana leaves and cups and plates, he thought was a very nice Brahmin. When he realized he's the Supreme Lord, he fainted. And then after some time, he came back to consciousness. The Lord was so happy with Sridhar. He said, uh, Sridhar, I want to give you something. Ask anything from me. What would you like? You want a nice wife? You want a, you want a house? Whatever you want. I'll even give you a planet if you want. <laughs> He was willing to give him anything. He was so pleased with Sridhar. And that's the way the Lord works. When the Lord is happy with the devotees, the devotees never have to ask anything from the Lord, even if you want something material. When the, when the devotee, when the Lord is pleased, he knows and he'll give it to you just to show his love for his devotee. He likes to give things to his devotee like that. So he wanted to give something to Sridhar. Sridhar refused. 
saying, my dear Lord, I don't need any, anything. I'm, I'm happy simply worshiping you. But the Lord was persistent. Same thing when he did with Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj, he wanted to give him some benediction. But Prahlad was just simply happy worshiping him in devotion. Finally, Sridhar responded by saying, my dear Lord, I'm happy. <laughs> All I want to do is worship you. Just come every day and, uh, you know, buy my banana, banana leaves and banana cups. And if I can simply see you, then my life is, is full of happiness. And, uh, and then he finally said, why do you want to give me all these things? I'm happy. <laughs> You're just going to make my life more miserable. <laughs> so... Yeah, so there is, there is, if from the material perspective, now we're talking material, there are two deficiencies, having too much and having too little. Having too little means you can't maintain yourself. Like if you don't have enough food, enough uh, opportunities for medical care when you need it, or clothing, housing, these things are basic, they're required. And one should make sure that they they uh, arrange their life in such a way as they can take care of the basic needs. So that's required. <laughs> but then again, there are people who have too much. Just like in the United States of America, you go and you drive along the highways, they have these big, gigantic warehouses, huge people renting, and they put all their junk in it. And they store all of this stuff in these U.S. I and mean, they pay money to rent these places. And then they take so much time to put, pile up all their stuff in this stuff. And uh, they just waste time collecting all this stuff. They never lose it anyway. But when they die, that somebody has to take it and give it away or throw it away. That's just... <laughs> so this is material life. It's ridiculous. So try to live according to what you need and execute devotional service. And that's what the Sri Yashupanishad cautions us. Ishavasya midam sarvan yadkinchat jagam teta jagat pena jaktena bundi jaha magudaha kasuswidanam. That everything animate and inanimate is owned and controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And one should live according to their quota. So everyone has their quota for what they need in order to live nicely in this world. Now, one person's quota may be different than another. One should not try to copy another and think it's my quota also. That's what goes on in the material world. People are rich and everybody thinks, oh, they're so successful. They're so happy they got so many things. And then the society points, you could also be like that if you work hard, if you go here, if you do this, if you get this particular position. And everybody is struggling to catch up. You know, it's like the old saying is, you know, let's become like the Joneses. <laughs> so they, but Prabhupada would also say, even people from India, they leave at India and they come to the West thinking, ah, oh, the West is so nice, big houses, big roads, and so many luxuries and that. When Prabhupada said, yeah, but then when they get here, they realize it's not like that. <laughs> it's hell. There's another feature of that material energy which causes people to suffer unnecessarily. So, and it's also understood from statistics that people who are the wealthiest are the most unhappy. And their highest suicide rate comes from people who have, not the people who are poor or impoverished or ordinary, but people who have born into big families or very wealthy. They're always in anxiety and sometimes they even commit suicide or they do something crazy and they, they cause harm to themselves and others. So this is material life. So here, so one, should, so the, the ultimate thing is here is that he uh, 
he had material happinesses, but he wasn't interested in it. All he wanted was to go back home and back to God. And that is the, the ultimate principle. So one has to focus on that. Um, the devotee should make, and it's called a sankalpa. A sankalpa is a vow that I will, I will become a pure devotee in this. It's a nice vow to make. We are pure by nature, but we are covered, and therefore we have to reveal that purity through the process of devotional service. It's not that we execute our devotional service and just go on. We should have goals. I want to chant purely. I want to develop very favorable relationships with all living entities. I want to know more about Krishna. I want to associate with devotees more. In other words, making these vows. I want to chant this amount of rounds. I want to read this much Shastra every day. So making these vows is, a, is an inspiration that allows us to uh, try to fulfill those vows, and that will help us to make progress in devotional service. And that's important. That's pointed out in the scriptures that one should have intermediate goals along with the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to go back home, back to God. Eh? Intermediate goals is the things that we, need, we want to achieve in the execution of our devotional service. That, that brings about uh, a, an advancement of consciousness and a greater understanding of our relationship with the Supreme Lord. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So wonderful class. You make it, it such complex things sound so, so simple. Thank you, thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. Um, and thank you for the fantastic examples that you were giving. With your kind permission, we would go ahead with the question and answer session, Maharaj. Thank you. Pralatananda Prabhu, would you like to unmute yourself? And yes, we'll go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you, Ramadan Mataji. And uh, then the pranam to all Vaishnavas and Swami. Uh, I have one question, uh, Prabhu uh, uh, Maharaj. Uh, why was uh, Chitraketu Maharaj not liberated from material world despite having audience with uh, Sankarshan uh, uh, himself? So did he have some material desires to uh, enjoy material world before going like that? Is there any explanation like that? I always wondered. So I was just curious about it, if you can help me with that. Uh, well, six canto culminates in Chitraketu, and then he uh, was riding on his airplane and then uh, enjoying uh, the freedom of li he was liberated and then he saw Parvati and Shiva and then he found some fault with Lord Shiva and then he was cursed to become a demon and in that demon body he went back, he was killed by Indra, and then he went back home, back to Godhead. That, that's towards, uh, did you get to that, you passed, did, did you pass that part yet? Yes, yes, I, I, I mean, I have read it, but my question was, you know, why was he not liberated when he had audience with Supreme Lord, uh, you know, in the first instance? Why was he given that uh, Vidyapati uh, body with the other, you know, body instead of getting spiritual parcel body, uh, did he have some material desire to enjoy? And you know, in the sixth uh, chapter of Bhagavad Gita, it says, "Pap ke pun punya katam lokam usipa saswati samaha." Means, you know, if you have some uh, material desire, or if you are, uh, uh, you know, a bhakti is not complete, then you, you will get intermediate kind of. Uh, uh, existence in a higher planets and then you take birth again and then get liberated like that. So <laughs> I was just wondering that. Yeah, it's obvious that there was some tinge of material. Uh, okay. Yeah. But <laughs> just like it says that 
when one very great devotee in our movement, he served Prabhupada so nicely. And uh, Prabhupada at the end said, after he left the body, Prabhupada said, he wrote him a letter. He wrote a letter des describing him and said, because of your devotional service and how you served, you know, selflessly, I I'm sure you went back home, back to Godhead. But even if there was a little material desire there, well, then you will go to the planet where Krishna is having his pastimes. And then mm -hmm. after that life, then you will return back home, back to Godhead. So material desires are very, very subtle. Mm -hmm. Any desire to enjoy, even if we're on the spiritual platform and we still want to enjoy on the spiritual platform, we haven't reached perfection yet. Mm -hmm. the, the ultimate perfection, perfection is, uh, as, uh, as it's mentioned in the uh, as lisya va pinaritam punastu mama darshana marmahatam karoti va vidata tava vidadati lampato matparam sastaneva maparaha. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives the formula. Of course, this is a very high stage that no matter what Krishna does, he can break me, he can kick me, he can not be before me. I'm still his devotee, life after life. Mm -hmm. So as long as there's any personal motivation that even if it's even if you want to associate with Krishna, that may also be a personal motivation also. It's it's very lofty, it's also spiritual. Therefore, one might may have to stay in the material world and associate with Krishna somewhere where he's having his pastimes, enjoy that association, purify themselves from that last tinge, and ultimately go back home, back to Godhead. The material desires are very subtle and hard to very understand. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Swami. Thank you very much. Obviously, that was the case with Tripti Ketu. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thanks uh, for let, reminding us that the material and the, those desires are so very subtle. We don't even know that they are coming. And then once we realize, it's too late. <laughs> Shiva Kumar Prabhuji, would you like to go ahead with your question, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances of your Lord of Sweet Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, my question today is uh, in my experience, Maharaj, uh, it, uh, the thing that I find it very difficult is uh, to accept and let go uh, that the life that I lived before coming to Krishna consciousness is predominantly you know, driven by Maya. So yeah. that seems to be the difficult uh, part of it. Just to pick up one example, Maharaj, uh, the material education, right, that have uh, done with a uh, lot of effort, in one way it is helping to read scriptures, do some introspection and uh, make some progress in bhakti. But other than that, uh, the material desires or goals that were, uh, uh, that were the, the material desires that were set as the goals for those efforts that have gone in there, I had to let them go uh, because it's it's just uh, Maya. So that uh, acceptance uh, feels very difficult, Maharaj. I just wanted to hear from you as to how can we deal with that. Whatever you've achieved on a material level, just use it in the service of the Lord. That's all. Yeah, manaso deho geho, you'll get you more arpi luto apade nandi kishore bhakti vinota kor trains. My home, my possessions, my family. My very body, it belongs to you. He's giving us the example that whatever we have, fine. You know, we have we have the example of Pundarik Vidyaniti. I mean, he was wealthy. He had, you know, he was very wealthy. And he lived in that same way, but he had no material attachments at the same time. So it's not wrong or 
to have material things or have mature, have achieved a certain level of consciousness based on being expert in using material things in in, in our day to day life. Just use it in Krishna service. That's it. Find out ways to use it. If you're a doctor, use it to serve the devotees. You are, whatever you are, whatever your abilities, you have, whatever resources you have, use it in the service of the Lord. They actually belong to the Lord. Krishna says, whatever you have is coming by me anyway. So, Rasha Jaham Riddhisani Visto, Matat Smirta Gyanama Pohan Cha. He says, I am the ability in all living entities. Whoever we are, whatever we are, whatever we achieve, is by the grace of the Lord coming through the material energy. But still, it belongs to the Lord. So when we use it in his service, it becomes purified. And rather than dragging us down into the material energy, it elevates us back to the back to God. So those same things are now assets for going back home back to God. And Prabhupada would say, um, he'd use the example, um, everything material is like a zero. And if you have so many material qualifications or material possessions, they're all zeros. But if you put a one in front of the zero, then whatever zero follows that number one multiplies the number by 10. And so in that sense, one who are as qualified materially can do great service for the Lord. And we want that too. Because of their material abilities, achievements, intelligence, and that way, they can use that that uh, those qualifications to serve the Lord and do great service in expanding Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for Thank you. listening. Does that help? <laughs> Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for explaining the Yukti Vairagya in such a simple term. Scarlett Mataji, you would like to go ahead and pose your question, Mata? Yes, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for today's class. Um, I, I have, I, I understand that everything we do everything we have is Krishna's. That's that I understand and that I fully respect and believe in it. But there is something that I am sometimes worried because I have six adult children. Sometimes they buy, just surprise me by the ticket because they don't live in the same city. They buy ticket to the train, come now. We are going to come and uh, take you. One of them come and take me. So that takes away time from uh, reading. For instance, I read very much. I read too much. So it takes time from my reading. How do I use this uh, situation to say to Lord Krishna, this is for you? Because in honesty, I don't think that is for Lord Krishna. If my children come and take me to, to them, I don't know if that I can say, this is for you, I do. I just make your children Krishna conscious. <laughs> okay. Yeah. By your association, because you're a devotee, practicing devotional service, give them what you, get, what you have and teach them. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mataji. We all have that problem. We do not know how to devote all our services to Krishna's name. Um, we have a question from Jyoti Mataji. She's saying, Hare Krishna, dear respectful Maharaji. My question is, when, when, one is very, when one's very near and dear one leaves their body, then the real gravity of the attachment and lamentation is encountered. It seems impossible to even practice how to devote time and service when um, the consciousness is not bhakti-oriented. Even if the practice is done, the feeling of cheating Krishna is strong. How to overcome this? The feeling of what towards Krishna is strong? 
So um, even if the, the sorry, of, say, you use the word I missed. Feeling of what towards Krishna is strong. Um, what me, was that word? Yeah, devote. Uh, Cheating. Cheating. It's it, she. So Jyoti Mataji is feeling that even if the practice that is done. The feeling of cheating towards Krishna is strong, that we are not actually doing it. It's we are cheating ourselves and Lord Krishna because the consciousness is not bhakti oriented. Uh, what part, uh, what, what is she indicating that is cheating? What so is she's indicating, uh, Maharaj, that even though we read so much scriptures and even if you read so much, our, um, do, when it comes to practical utilization of not to lament over things, especially towards um, when we have very strong attachment towards our loved ones and when the loved one leaves their body, and we are so strongly attached, we are not able to, um, at that time, we are pretending that we are Krishna conscious. It seems like we are cheating ourselves and we are cheating Krishna. We forget to utilize this in, in depth when it comes to practice. And how do you overcome that? Using that example of a departure of a loved one, there's obviously some, some sadness, some loss. Hmm. But go through that and then move on. It's not that you stay there. Hmm. That's normal. When someone dear, near and dear to you leaves, and then you, you feel some sadness, but then you understand actually that that person who is my relative or my friend is actually a pure spirit soul. So I, then we pray for them. And may Krishna give them his mercy so they can get elevated in their next life or maybe even attain the spiritual realm. So we can try to benefit them by praying for them on their surge on and then towards their next uh, situation. You have to see everything from the spiritual perspective. We also may feel some unhappiness because of the departure of someone dear to us. And that's normal. That's normal. But we don't dwell on that and just well in the unhappiness, we we experience that unhappiness, and then we move on after some time. Well, you can pray for them, and that's Krishna conscious. Thank you so much, Maharaj. It's so simple. Yes, we can go ahead and pray for the departed soul. Yeah. That yeah. Understand that that, is that soul who played the role of my relative and friend, they're not that body. That body is them. That body is just the, the covering of who they actually are. We never see that person. Or the soul is not to be seen, at least from the material world. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Prabhuji. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for such wonderful explanation. Sri Devi Mataji, would you like to go ahead with your question, Mata? Thank you. Your Guru Maharaj, thank you for this class. Ma Guru Maharaj, you mentioned at one point that even a tinge of material desire, like I want to be with Krishna, I want to see Krishna, I want to go back to Krishna, means that one still has personal motivation. And therefore, one will not go right back to the spiritual world, but will take birth in one of the material worlds where Krishna is performing his pastimes and purify oneself of the desire. But then aren't we always told one should desire to go back to Godhead, one should desire to get back to the material, uh, spiritual world, one should desire to uh, go back to Krishna. Yeah, but then again, that desire is there, but then what are you going to do to fulfill that desire? You have to, therefore, Ananya, what is that verse? Ananya Krishna Shunyam. You have to act. And if you're acting, if you're acting on the pure platform, then you'll purify yourself and go back home, back to God. 
But as soon as you say, I want, your, your motivation is hinged. Mm. Mm. I see. If you want to say, I want to go back to Godhead, that's nice. But if you say, I simply want to please Krishna, that's higher. Mm. Okay. I want to please Krishna, that's higher. Thank you, Maharaj, for the clarification. My humble obedience. Thank you so much, Maharaj. We have a comment from uh, Shukha. Mataji is saying the Bhagavatam says he, he chanted the mantra given by Narada Muni for a week and then attained lotus feet of Sankarsana. She's talking about Pralladananda uh, um, Prabhu. It's a question. Okay. Yes, it's, it's a comment on what Prantananda. Prabhuji has mentioned. Devotees, any other questions that you might have for Maharaj? Feel free to unmute your videos, unmute yourself, so Maharaj can bless you all, he can see you all. <laughs> I can't bless anybody. Hare <laughs> Krishna. Be cool. You got some question? <laughs> uh, to be honest, Maharaj, thank you for this wonderful class. I unmuted just to wish you, but the comment I have is that today you have taught me, or me, me my wife, a very important lesson of creating time. Time. We are all fighting when we want to develop spiritually. Eventually, I'm discarding things that take my time and trying to clear the desk. It takes, uh, of course, it will take time to achieve that. But the idea is, like you say, by living and create more time for spiritual development. We are seeking that, and we got that message clearly today from your lesson. Thank you, Hare Krishna. The greatest, the, one of the most unfortunate situations that a person can experience is that when they're about to leave the world, they think, oh, I wasted so much time in material pursuits. I could have used more time for my Krishna consciousness. Don't get to that point. Don't allow that to happen. Lamenting that after everything is all over, I just wasted so much time. In the tears. Therefore, use your time wisely. Mm. Thank you. Very, very valuable point, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for reminding us. Yes. Um, Raj Prabhu, you have a question? Thank you. Hi, Krishna. Raj, our end could be very imminent. So what is the fastest way for us to reach that platform where we just want to say, Krishna, I'm totally surrendered to you. I'm yours. And I just want to please you. I just want to serve you at every moment of every day. Bhakti Vinod Dakur, he prays like that. But we can't imitate it, but he's praying. You, you're talking about what is that mood that we should adopt or what is that lifestyle that we should adopt? Or both? Yes, both. Um, what is that ver What is that prayer by Bhakti Vinod Thakur? Gita Janmo Mata Tuva Dhamma Gita Janmo My dear Lord, you can kill me or you can 
you can uplift me. You can do whatever you want when you're Rita Janmo Adha Du Adha That Bhakti Vinoda is giving us the ultimate principle. He sings it in one of his songs. I'm yours. It doesn't matter what you do to me. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. That's the, that's the highest. You may also use that verse. The last verse in the Shikshastika Mosa. Namrata Mataji. Would you like to go ahead with your question, Mataji? Namrata Mata. Whatever I have is yours, my Lord. Whatever time left in this material world I have, let me use it for your service only. We have to understand this world is a jail. That's all it is. <laughs> it's not a place to live and become happy. There's no question of becoming happy here. It's just a jail. If you get a good cell inside of the jail, you might think, wow, I'm better than the other prisoners. But still, you're a prisoner. <laughs> As long as we're encumbered by this material body, we cannot fulfill our desires for happiness. Not possible. The material world is what it is. Krishna says it over and over. Miserable and it's temporary. So, just focus your attention on Krishna. You can do your other things that you need to do in order to live, but don't make that the source of your happiness. Just get it done. It's like you have you have to take a bath, you have to clean yourself. You have to do certain things to maintain the body, but you do it because it's necessary. So we do our material things because it may be necessary, at least in a certain stage of our life. And, but we get on with our real business, Krishna consciousness. Navrata, you had a question. Yes, Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, you said uh, the uh, most unfortunate thing is uh, to uh, not do the devotional service, but at the end of your life, you uh, regret. Uh, that I wasted my life. So uh, I was just thinking, uh, this is also the mood of Acharyas. Then like Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he also had that mood that he he practically did a lot of things. He, he gave a roadmap to us with which we are still carrying out. And he still felt that I, oh, I wasted my life then what is the difference between that mood and our mood? I was just thinking that. that that's, the, that's the mood of a Vaishnava. He didn't waste, but because of his natural humility, he feels like he did. But for us, we have to make sure we don't. <laughs> And fall into that, you know, idea that we got plenty of time and, you know, I'm young. And I got so many plans for the future.
They say youth is youth is folly. Youth is folly because as you go older, you start to understand more about the values of life, which happens even in the material sense. When you're young, you don't talk about renunciation. We talk about giving up so many things. Or you still got desires to fulfill them. But fulfill those desires by becoming, by engaging in devotional service. Devotional service is sense satisfaction. It satisfies the senses. If Krishna is pleased, then you're pleased. And if you're pleased, that's, that's perfection. Try to please Krishna. That's it. Find out from the spiritual master how to please Krishna and go ahead and do it. And we can always chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. That's very pleasing. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur's lamentation at the end of his life is spiritual. Ours may be material. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. So Maharaj, can somebody have some material goals side by side their spiritual goals and while they are also proceeding towards the material goals they can keep offering it like a yuktya vairagya towards krishna yeah mm -hmm. yeah but make sure it's vairagya not just yuktya <laughs> mm. <laughs> very very true maybe we are feeling fooling ourselves we think it's it's vairagya but actually it's not well, How do we understand that? Yeah, people think, well, I need to get rich so I can give a lot of money to Krishna. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> then they waste their time trying to get rich <laughs> when, they, <laughs> when they could be doing devotional service. Person doesn't need anything from us. He just wants our our uh, our devotion. But we give him things because otherwise if we don't, then we'll use them for our own self. Therefore we offer to him in devotion. And he accepts not so much the offering, but the mood that it's offered him. That's why he says, Patram Pushram Palam Tayam Yomi Bhakti Panashiti. You can offer me these insignificant things, but with bhakti, that's the difference. So what's significant is the bhakti. But if you have a lot and you give Krishna just a little bit, that means you're still trying to enjoy what you have. You have to give in proportion to what Krishna is giving you also. Mm. Otherwise, you'll just use it for your own sense benefit. Maintaining the body doesn't take much. <laughs> really, not that. Although in the Western culture, they make it a big program just to maintain the body, but it's not not needed. Maharaj, thank you so much for taking all our questions and answers. Are you tired, Maharaj? Should we end the class or we can take one more question? 
I think we can stop here. It's about, it's an hour and 20 minutes already. Okay. 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 Yes. Let's, okay. let's pay our humble obeisances to Maharaj while we are in <coughs> class. What? Vancha Kalpata Vancha Kalpata Rupyaksha Krupa Sindhu Yavacha Atita Nam Pavanityo Vaishnavityo Namo Namaha Namo Namaha Namo Namaha Swami Maharaj Ki Jai Thank you very much. Thank you.